just want to thank all of you for coming out and joining us. We have been in somewhat of a season of endurance. I don't know if anybody can relate uh, with this, this need to endure, and we're just thankful to be together, to have a place to meet, to gather, to worship. And so I want to invite you as we're making our way to our seats and, and finishing up some, some coffee fill-ups to stand with us as we get ready to worship. Just help me this morning begin to just express gratitude to the Father. Lord, we lift our hands to you. We surrender to you. We say thank you, Father. You're rich and plentiful in mercy. You're the one who knows what we need. You're the one who knows how to satisfy us, oh, Father. Oh, come on. Let's just release some joy this morning. You're the one that we desire, God. You're the one that we want. We bless you. We love you, Lord. And we come to worship and to seek you this morning, oh, God. Would you feel this atmosphere with your presence? Would you fill our hearts with joy and gratitude towards you, our amazing Father? Yeah, we bless you, Lord. We thank you and we honor you, God. We commit ourselves to you this morning. Let us worship and let us be filled with joy, family. Bless you. Welcome. God, 
let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done.
Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn Christ by highest heaven adored, <laughs> offspring of a virgin's womb, filled in flesh the God has seen. Hail the incarnate, please as men with meant to dwell Jesus our Emmanuel Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King <laughs> Here we go The heaven born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the new. Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man may no more die. of earth born to give him second birth hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king Jesus is our King. Well, we're just going to extend forth here uh, a little more worship. Just press in a little bit. We're going to sing this song, Too Good to Not Believe, because that's who He is. He's too good to not believe. You're so good, Lord. You're so amazing. You're awesome in power. We bless you, Lord. We bless your name this morning. 
It's all about you, Jesus. Come on, things in this earth, they come, they go. But you never end, Lord. You're the one who comes with an everlasting kingdom. You've come to bring good news, healing hope, resurrection power for us. You've come to save us, redeem us, heal us, restore us. There's none like you, Jesus. There's none like you. You've picked us up out of the muck and the mire. You've saved us. Come on, you've given us life and life evermore. Oh, come on, you come to give life, Jesus. You come to give life, and we celebrate you this morning. We love you, Lord, and you are so, so good. You're too good to not believe. Come on, let's worship a little more. I've lived stories that proved your faithfulness. I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend. There is beauty in what I can understand. Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. I believe you're the wonder-working God. You're the wonder-working God. All the miracles I've seen, too good to not believe. You're the wonder-working God. Would you heal because you love all the miracles I've seen. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. And I can't resurrect a man with my own hands. But just the mention of your name can raise the dead. So all the glory to the only one who can. Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. I believe you're the wonder-working God. You're the wonder-working God. All the miracles I've seen, too good to not believe. You're the wonder-working God. Would you heal because you love? All the miracles we'll see. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. Too good to not believe. disappear I've seen metal plates dissolve don't you tell me he can't do it don't you tell me he can't do it I've seen real life resurrection I've seen mental health restored don't you tell me he can't do it don't you tell me he can't do it I've seen families reunited I've seen prodigals return Don't you tell me he can't do it Don't you tell me he can't do it I've seen addicts finally free I've seen addicts finally free Don't you tell me he can't do it Don't you tell me he can't do it We'll see cities in revival And salvation flood the streets don't you tell me he can't do it Don't you tell me he can't do it We'll see glory fill the nation Like the world has never seen Don't you tell me he can't do it Cause I know that he can I believe you're the wonder-working God You're the wonder-working God all the miracles we'll see 
too good to not believe you're the wonder working God and you heal because you love all the miracles we'll see too good to not believe too good to not believe too good to not believe love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Your goodness. Your goodness, God. And let's just reflect for a moment. I don't know what the years looked like for you. I know it's had some highs, and I know it's had some lows. I know there's been some good times, and I know there's been some hard times. I know I've seen blessing, and I've seen challenge. But I know this morning that my God is faithful and he doesn't lose and he doesn't back down and he never stops loving us and he never stops moving in us. He's too good to not believe. I know that his mercy endures forever. I want to read Psalms 136. Psalms 136 has been pumping into my bloodstream with strength. Come on, we need strength this morning. We need strength, your children, God. Come on, there's some greater things ahead of us. And I see on the horizon a great awakening. I see on the horizon a great shaking in our city. Oh, and the enemy doesn't like it, does he, Bob? No. He don't like it. But we're not going to back down. We're going to contend for the goodness of our God and that his mercy will endure. Psalms 136 reads like this. For his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the King of kings for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule the day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever to him who divided the Red Sea in two for his mercy endures forever he made Israel pass through the midst of it for his mercy endures forever he overthrew Pharaoh in his army in the Red Sea help me church for his mercy endures forever To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever. We stand together, a people who has a God who's full of mercy, and his mercy endures. His mercy endures our hard seasons, 
His mercy endures our weakness. His mercy endures our frailty. His mercy endures. And we stand here, the beloved of God, because he's faithful and good and just, and he's rich in mercy. You're rich in mercy, God. And oh, how we're desperate for you. And we're hungry for you, God. We're hungry for you. We need more of you. We need more of you in our land. We need more of you in our families. We need more of you in our hearts. We need more of you, God. We need more. Come on, this is a time to, to, to lay a foundation that we need more of him. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own might. We can't do it without you, God. We need more of you. You have a rich, beautiful kingdom, God, that we participate in, that we've become citizens of. And we need that wisdom and that mercy to greater live in that kingdom and express that kingdom and give that kingdom to the world around us, God. So our prayer this morning is endure with us. Come on, I don't know about you guys, but I probably made some mistakes this year. I probably didn't do everything the right way, but, but I know that he's merciful. I know that he's kind. I know that I probably let my mouth say things it shouldn't have said. I know I probably allowed myself to, to get caught in distractions the way I shouldn't have. But his mercy endures. Oh, come on. There, there's an endurance. God, would you rain down from heaven this morning? And would you pour out endurance on us, God? Because we need you. Just lift our hands this morning as the Lord mercifully pours out endurance on us and strength on us. Come on, right where we are, whatever the season is for you, there's endurance, there's strength, there's healing, there's hope, there's transformation. morning, Lord, to pour out on us. You're the God who pours out mercy. Come on, there's, there's a lot of mercy coming from the throne this morning, and that mercy is going to give us strength. That mercy is going to give us the ability to stand up in the face of adversity. You were built for adversity. We were built for adversity. Come on. We were built for it. We were made for it. We can stand right here, right now. And we say, no matter what's going on around me, my God is my God. And he deserves all of my praise. And he deserves all of my worship. Pour it out this morning, God. We bless you. We honor you, Jesus. And it is in your mighty name that we pray. Amen, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord just a hand of praise this morning. He's good. He's faithful. I want to thank you all for being here, that we can celebrate this season together and just worship him. Come on, till the wheels fall off. That's right. We're going to take a short break, and you can get some coffee. There might still be some donuts back there, Pastor Jerry. I don't know. It's getting thin. Uh, but just meet somebody new, greet somebody, and we'll continue with the service in just a few moments. Welcome. Bless you. Good morning, Ridgecrest Vineyard Church. All right, hopefully you're grabbing some coffee. We hope we didn't run out of coffee. I'm sure we ran out of donuts. Um, that's just, it's okay. Um, so yesterday, uh, I got to go to Mammoth to, uh, to you know, be part of the, like, well, just see the, the Festival of Lights. And I realized something that's very true in my life, that there'll be, there'll be a time where I may not need coffee anymore, Pastor Validia. But until I get some sleep, I I'm always going to need coffee. 
So when I was out there, we got back home pretty late, and I was just like, I, I needed a coffee from the moment I woke up. So just, I just need coffee. I think that's just my motto. <laughs> hey, I don't know if you guys got the memo this week, um, or this, this week about, I, you, you, you dress nice, or we're be kind of funny looking. Uh, ugly sweater. Oh, I gotta think your mic's off, Pastor Olivia. Oh, it's not on. That one, that's right. It was ugly sweater or dress in Christmas colors. And Pastor Jerry, I had an ugly sweater last year, but I threw it out because it was so ugly. Oh, oh. I, I, I like Baby Yoda though, isn't he cute? Little Baby Yoda. If you have grandkids, Baby Yoda's the best. Just, or, or little kids, Baby Yoda, a little Grogu here. And Merry Christmas to you all. Um, love that we get to celebrate together in a little warmer environment. <laughs> It would have been really tough to celebrate uh, in the parking lot. And uh, we're just thankful that we are able to, to gather together. I um, want to share some things. Hopefully you got a bulletin this morning. If you didn't get a bulletin, if you can raise your hand, our ushers will get you a bulletin. Nate and the ushers uh, will get you a bulletin if you, if you uh, don't have one. So I um, want to just let you know, highlight some things for you. Uh, we're trying to get things back into the flow, but at the same time, we're also uh, taking some time for the Christmas break here. Our uh, uh, ushers can get some bulletins to our friends that are raising their hands. Um, so just want to let you know some things. So next week, we're going to uh, restart the fire starters. So that's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, so that's going to be at 930. So you want to show up a little bit earlier. And this is the time we get to worship um, and just focus and just really start a fire here in this place. Um, and then uh, we'll continue with our, our, our services. I also want to let you know that we're uh, some activities. We're going we're gonna to do a thing we, we call rest recharge and restart so during this next week um, next couple of weeks we're going to do some rest restart recharging and restarting so um, for instance our community game night we had an awesome time this last monday we had like soup competition i think i won um <laughs> what did you make uh, i made the chicken noodle soup it was the other one the other chicken noodle oh. soup <laughs> didn't you see it it was there we had albondigas, we had like, like this, it was really good, it was great. Um, Green chicken, yeah. enchilada soup. Oh, yeah, that, that was that really was good, wild. yeah, picadillo, it was, it was, it was on, on point, but we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break from a, a community game night. Um, the youth, uh, Next Gen, is also taking a break. I was like, hey, when, don't you guys want to just keep going? And like, well, we need a little break too. We need to, to rest, recharge, and, and uh, restart here in the new year. So we're going to take a break here the next couple of weeks on some of those activities. Uh, you want to talk about School of Kingdom Ministry? Yeah, so School of Kingdom Ministry. Um, so it's awesome. Okay, so if you're one of the students, it is awesome. We, um, I just want to highlight some things that have happened since um, we started. So we started off, you know, identity in Christ. We, we um, talked about prophecy. So we talk about it and we activate and we practice on each other. And then we took it out into the community. So what we would do is we broke up in groups. And I said, now I want you to ask God where he's going to highlight. He might want you to go to Starbucks, Walmart, Walgreens, the park. And so each group, there was a place highlighted. My group went to Walmart. And I seen a woman in the parking lot in this vision. And so me and a couple people, we go over there. Here's a woman. And she, of course, there's going to be people in the, in the parking lot. But there was one particular woman that I seen. She has dark hair. God kind of highlighted what she would look like. So I see this woman go up to her. I ask, hey, can we pray for you? She's like, yeah. So we pray for her. Her husband had just had a heart attack. Um, she was so grateful we were there. She was, I cannot believe. I came to come to shop at Walmart, and people are praying for me right now, my husband. And then there's another young man. He's walking out. And I just, I, I looked at his this beautiful curly hair, and I just made a comment. I said, I love your hair. And he looks, and he goes, I love your hair. And I go, hey, can I pray for you? And he's like, sure. So he comes on over, and me and the others start praying for him. And we give him a word. And he says, you know, this week has been the most horrible week. He goes, my family's falling apart. I don't know what's going on with my sister. So we're praying about that. And he goes, man, you guys don't know what you did for me tonight. Like, I feel good, I feel better. He said, you guys are changing the world. <laughs> it, was, it was just these little moments. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to gather together, hear God's voice, and take it out in the community. We're gonna restart up again in January. We're, gonna, we're connecting a little bit with, with Bethel School in Redding, California for their um, 
their, the BSSM, so they have a school of ministry there too. So I'm getting some of the curriculum there. They're sharing and we're gonna do some more curriculum. So it's gonna, we're gonna go a little deeper, guys. So I invite you, if you wanna go a little deeper with us, come on out. I love that, uh, you know, my son gets to be part of that. He's, uh, he's back to the curly haired kid. Um, I love that, you know, he gets to be, be sent out, you know, he, you know, he goes to Burroughs High School and he gets to pray for his friends. He gets to minister to them. And, and, I, and I, I love that he got to learn to do all this in an environment at the School of King Ministry. So he, he's been prepared to go into the world to be light in the darkness. So I'm so excited for uh, January when you guys restart. He's actually a really awesome, really awesome in, in oh. school. I got to tell you, he's so, th this boy's on fire. <laughs> hard, hard. Have you been? I Where love it. Are? Yeah, amen. So uh, just some upcoming events that are happening this week. So this Wednesday, um, we're going to have our toy giveaway and Christmas celebration. So we'll be doing that here at, at the fairgrounds from 6 to 8 p.m. We're going to have enchiladas. Pastor Dakota likes enchiladas, loves enchiladas. Favorite food is enchiladas. Chicken, especially green chicken enchiladas. Karen, taking notes. Karen, double portion for this man right here. One for here, one to go home. All right, good. You got that. All right. So 6 to 8 p.m., we're going to be giving out toys and just having a good time of fellowship and food. And... Um, as we uh, you know, take, take some time here over the next few days to, for, to celebrate Christmas and enjoy time um, uh, uh, with our families. And so I uh, also want to let you know that our midweek services will be restarting again in January, January 5th. So we'll be uh, doing a restart of that. We had to take a pause because we're like, you know, outside and it was hard at night. And so but since we have the space secured for the next few weeks until we're able to get back into our main building, um, we're going to be able to start re those uh, midweek services. And, and we talked about that, just the, the opportunity that we have here to, to get back into the flow of things and um, just see what God has for us in, in store. I uh, also want to highlight that the Kate ministry, Pastor Bob, we're going to be going out there. Yeah. We're going to install in some solar. What's really neat about this ministry is that, that um, how God highlighted the Kate for us as an out, it's a ministry. And, uh, you know, do, during all this you know, transition and, and turbulent times that we've been going through since our, our building has been red tagged. You know, some of the things got, got put on hold, but we said we got to continue. And so we're going to um, continue the week of uh, January 26th. Um, we're going to be going from December 28th to 31st uh, out there to, if you want to be part of that, come talk to Pastor Bob, you know, right here, there he is. And um, he'll, you, get, you get in contact with Pastor Bob. Amen. And uh, we're going to be going out there and installing a solar system, doing some construction work. Uh, at the city in the dump site. That's like, actually like, if you can believe it, imagine going to our dump site here in, in uh, Ridgecrest um, and, and there's a church building right there. And the reason is that the people, the city of, of Tijuana and Tecate, they dump people in there that are, are on the streets and they just take them there. I see, we saw it firsthand and you see, like, you see them like rolling a little suitcase or whatever they got and they're in there and they're living, uh, whatever they can make of their house, they, they, they got cardboard or just whatever they, you know, just old material. And they're living there. And, and we were just wrecked. Bob was wrecked. Their pastor Bob was totally wrecked. And we realized that God has a mission. And the reason that people are there is because they're there uh, because of, uh, oftentimes because of uh, alcohol and, and uh, substance abuse issues. And so we're like, like well, well, we're called for that. We're uniquely, as a church, we're uniquely called to do that kind of ministry. And so how God connected everything is pretty amazing. But I just want to let you know we're going to continue in that ministry, the Gate ministry. Um, in a couple of weeks here, we'll be going there. And so Pastor Bob is our, our point man on that, and we'll be we're going over there for that. want to highlight just again uh, what's happening. <laughs> Obviously, we're not in our building, so campus update here is that we're, we are making a lot of progress. Uh, the uh, fire alarm company started the installation last week, which is like everything got expedited. So we're praying. Keep praying because God is expediting this whole process for us. Um, they told us, like, you know, they, they would take weeks, months to get some of these uh, permits, but we've been getting them really quickly. And so uh, that's a, a really good news. Pastor Dakota's praying that we get in next week, but we don't know. Uh, so until that happens, we get the all clear. They have to install some fire alarm systems in there, and uh, they've made a lot of progress. Um, and so as those get installed, then we'll be able to transition. Uh, and then uh, our immediate need for that, um, it always seems like they always charge us $30,000 for every kind of thing that they do. Um, so we're, we're, we're pushing through. Um, uh, with the previous bill to do the fire sprinkler system certification, we had to do that. That cost us $30,000. Now we're going to have to prepare for this other bill of $30,000 for the fire alarm system in our building. So, um, you know, and this is a teasing of, of giving and, and just uh, stretching. And so I want to encourage you to, to give spontaneously. Give 
uh, purposefully, but don't give grudgingly, right? Give joyfully. God loves a, a cheerful and joyful giver. And so just give, uh, uh, God has provided provision for you. Just give in that regard. Don't feel, again, pressured to do that. And so I'm going to invite our ushers to take their place. And Pastor Valia, would you pray for us uh, for this offering this morning? Lord, I just thank you so much that you are in the house. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. And you're about ready to touch hearts, God, and give breakthroughs and breathe on dry bullet bones, God. And Lord, I pray that you would breathe on our finances. Breathe on our finances, God, and stir the hearts, Lord, that, that you want to give, Lord. And I just pray, God, that we would see this opportunity to be a part of something so much greater than us, God. Have your way, God, and I pray blessings upon blessings upon each person, God, and that everything they give, God, would be multiplied, multiplied back to them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Our ushers are going to pass out the offering baskets. Uh, to continue us here with our, our series, our building, kingdom building series, Pastor Dakota, our lead pastor. Love this man. Love his resilience. I got to tell you, uh, you know, it's, it's such a privilege to, to um, minister and journey alongside Pastor Dakota and, Pastor, and uh, his wife, Monica. Um, I got to tell you, like, I, I've never uh, been so just, um, just, just wrecked by, oh, I'm sorry, right now. just been wrecked by, by being able to minister and do what we've been, what we've been doing the last three years. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I would like to highlight, the, we'll probably highlight that in the new year. But just amazing how God has just been moving in our lives, in my family's life. And I'm just so encouraged. And I um, want to just say thank you, Pastor Dakota, for everything you do. God bless you. And well, thank you. Thank you both. We have amazing leaders and pastors and, and just an amazing church. You know, I, I, I'm so grateful to serve and be a part of uh, this work that God is doing at RVC, and and I love that it's it's unique and it's different. It's a different kind of experience than I've had uh, in church in my life, and and I'm I'm grateful to be a part of something where we're we're really really desperate for God to do His thing because we're just not really capable of doing these things without Him. If if you don't know, we have an organization called the Refuge in which we help individuals. Um, just like myself at one point, um, get a life set free from substance abuse. I once went through a very, very dark season of life and addiction and, and just had a radical encounter with God that changed my life, that stole my life. And, and ever since then, it's just been uh, a journey seeking him. And so we're desperate for God. We really, really need him. And so thank you all for, uh, for being a part of that in whatever way that you are supporting that. And, and we're just grateful to have you uh, here with us. Uh, we've been in a series uh, through the book of Nehemiah. Anybody familiar with Nehemiah? I'm going to be wrapping that series up this morning for us. But I want you to look to the person sitting next to you and tell them your kingdom builder. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Look to the person on the other side and say, and give them a finger, give them a pointer finger. You're a kingdom builder. You know, uh, here at the Vineyard Church, one of our core, core uh, frameworks of ministry in church and community is that we're a people of the kingdom. We, we believe that when Jesus made his remark to the earth that said, I have a kingdom that is without end. Or he may have said to some, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's at hand. And so we're a people who believe in the kingdom of God and that we're participants of that kingdom. That, that we're to live in, express, and give that kingdom away. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so we've been looking at Nehemiah, and we've been spending time in this book of Nehemiah to affirm to ourselves and our community that we're kingdom builders. Nehemiah built a physical kingdom, rather we build a spiritual kingdom. Does this make sense? And so we're looking at Nehemiah, and we're saying, man, what did Nehemiah and these boys back then do to build that wall, to, to build up the kingdom, to build up Jerusalem? Like, what did they do in that context 
to be led by God, to be the children of God, be led by him and make significant impact in that community. And so we've been looking at Nehemiah and we found that in Nehemiah, there's like four strong seasons in Nehemiah. You can look at them as four themes or four seasons or, or, or four real highlighted areas in, that flow th- like a thread through the whole book. That first season that really jumps out to us in Nehemiah, I'm just recapping, maybe some of you haven't got all of these messages, but, but the first season that really jumps out of the pages of Nehemiah for us is that Nehemiah had determination. We're going to be kingdom builders. We're going to have to have grit. Come on, we're going to have to be determined. We're going to have to make a decision. This is the purpose of my life. It doesn't matter what storm I come to. It doesn't matter when the highs come or the lows come. If I feel weak or if I feel strong, I'm going to have to be determined that this is the purpose of my life. To build the kingdom of God. To advance the kingdom of God. And Nehemiah expressed that determination in a many ways. But one of the things that really marked Nehemiah's life to me is I found that Nehemiah, he wasn't afraid to sacrifice. Wasn't afraid to sacrifice his own comfort. I know this is really encouraging this morning. As soon as, soon as he starts talking about sacrifice, it's like, oh, here we go. It's Christmas. Come on. We're, I do know it's Christmas season. I know. I know. He, over here. Okay. He, he wasn't afraid to sacrifice his own comfort. See, Nehemiah had position. He had power. And he had plenty. He was a governor, right? He was a person of power. He was a person of position. He had plenty of resources. And he said, you know what? I'm going to ask the king if the king will let me return to my land that's in ruins. If he'll let me go and help me build the walls of Jerusalem. And I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to leave my comfort. I'm willing to leave my plenty. I'm willing to leave my power to go and build. Now, just wrap your head around this for a moment. Come on, he's got position in the king's house. But he's willing to go to a land of ruins because he had an urgency from God. He was determined. God had put it in his bones. Come on, you've got to see your people revived. You've got to be hungry for revival. You've got to be hungry and desperate to see the kingdom of God advance in our city. Come on, we're those people. We're Nehemiah kingdom builders that got to be determined to see the kingdom of God advance and shine bright in the city of Ridgecrest, just like Nehemiah. It's going to take determination. It's going to take determination. The second season that came in the book of Nehemiah and his life was real quickly we saw the tone that if he's going to build the walls and build the kingdom, if you and I are going to build the kingdom of God, we'll see opposition. Come on, there was all of those taunting voices and those voices of discouragement and those people of opposition that stood and wanted to stagnate and to stop the building of the wall. And as they were talking, Nehemiah was already navigating a plan of how we get through this opposition. He was saying they're they're still planning and plotting their attack and their opposition. And Nehemiah's like, come on, come over here. We're going to get some swords. We're going to get some hammers, and we're going to build with one hand, and we're going to defend ourselves with the other hand. He, he's saying it doesn't matter the opposition that comes. We will not stop. We're going to find a way to keep building. And I don't know what to tell you this morning that's going on in your life that makes you want to stop. And opposition comes, and it presses you, and it's pressure, and it hurts, and it feels like it's giving you no way out. And God's saying just keep building. Don't let opposition stop you. Don't let the voices or the noise, don't let the naysayers, don't let the brokenness, don't let the past, don't let any of that stop you from building the kingdom of God in your life, in your family. Third season that came was a season of great devotion. Everybody say devotion. The people in their season of ruin and in their captivity from Babylon had been in this place where where they've lost sight of temple worship, of temple gatherings, of the teachings, uh, of temple order, of uh, uh, all these things that were established and how the people worshipped God and how they properly, you know, identified him as priority in their life. That had been vanished. And Nehemiah, as he's building the wall, 
midsections of the book of Nehemiah makes a decision that, you know what, we've got to start getting the wheels of devotion turning again. We've got to start meeting regularly. We got to start finding a way for, for people to establish their homes again and, and, and for the people to, to get their devotional life centered again. And could you say in the cities that we live in, in our city, that there are many people, probably each of us could look around and think something has happened in somebody's life around us that has caused for their devotion to be disrupted. And can I tell you this morning that it is our job as kingdom builders to get into those people's ear and let them know your God wants to hear from you and he's there for you. He hadn't left you. He hadn't forsaken you. He won't stop. Bring us to a restored devotion. Can we see that over a city? Can we see over a city restoration of devotion to God. I bet you if I travel back in time, many of people have lived in this city right here for some years can remember the sweetness of his presence in moments and seasons of church life and church community and in this city where, where we sensed God was deeply honored and, and maybe that through the years that's been disrupted. But can I tell you, we are in the hour of restoration of devotion towards our God in great honor and deep conviction to follow him with a whole life, with a whole heart. And can I tell you this morning, I see on the horizon a great awakening in the city of Ridgecrest and a people that are going to awaken and arise to devotion again to God. And you and I are a part of that. Well, that's got to get imprinted inside of us. I know we got our own struggles to overcome. Praise God, I've got mine. But there's something about us being a collective group of people like Nehemiah and them boys. I like to say that. Not the cowboys. Y'all better stop. We don't do it like that. Nehemiah and company... And we've got to be like them. We've got to come together as a collective group. And we've got to make a decision of the value and the importance of devotion being a banner over our city. Come on, there, there, there's things we can do in our neighborhoods, with our neighbors, in our homes, in our churches. Not forsaking the gathering. There's a lot going on at RBC. And we, we intentionally do a lot of things. Because we try to make as many roads and avenues towards family and devotion and these kinds of things to happen. And so maybe you can't make it on Monday nights, but you can make it on Tuesdays. Maybe you can't make it on Tuesdays, but you can make a midweek recharge. Yeah, we're, 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 we're ready, come on, to see devotion restored again in our community. And this morning I'll be wrapping up Nehemiah with the theme of avoiding deviation. Everybody say deviation. In chapter 12, there's a great celebration happening in Jerusalem. They're celebrating the completion of the wall. They're celebrating this restored devotion. They're excited. They're having this, this you know, final sort of honor and recognition of all of the work that has been done. They're dedicating the wall dedicating themselves back to God. And so chapter 12 is beautiful. And as soon as you turn the page to chapter 13, it becomes a very daunting experience. We're faced in, 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 with the sort of unforgettable pattern of the Israelites and their tendency and propensity to find themselves saved and redeemed by God and have themselves and their provision recovered and then begin to deviate again. It's this pattern we see throughout Old Testament literature and we follow the history of the Israelites where, where they get themselves, you know, really under God's, you know, blessing and they're in this place of properly honoring God and then something happens and they deviate and they become captive to their own decisions. Anybody ever felt like that before? <laughs> oh, why me? Woe is me. No, we become captive to our decisions. I'm sorry, is that, am I a little too loud with that? Is that a real thing? Maybe it's just me this way. Okay. And so they, they, we see this, this reality of what happens to us when we deviate from the instruction and the plan of God for our life. We can relate. We can relate. And so here in chapter 13, 
we see a daunting turn of events. It seems like all this victory is happening. And we come to this moment where the people begin to deviate. Can I tell you this morning, it doesn't have to be us because we have a greater high priest, right? We're under the blood. We're under the cross. We're under this incredible salvation that happens through faith by grace. And so there's something really spectacular and unique happening for us in that we have the power of the Holy Spirit inhabiting us. Not just visiting us, not just coming to us, but he's actually designed himself to inhabit and dwell us. Earthen vessels, Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And so we don't have to deviate, but it still happens. And I just hope that we can grab from Nehemiah this morning some, some strong sort of insights towards what we can do to avoid deviation. I think there are some really clear uh, steps and insights for us here in Nehemiah. So if you have notes, we hand those out. If you want to follow along with me, I want to give us four insights this morning that I think uh, will, will add some benefit to us in understanding what causes us to deviate in the instruction of God for our life and why we don't have to. Where if we stay led, we stay filled with the Holy Spirit, we stay following Holy Spirit, we can be a people who avoid deviating. And we can stay on center and on track with God's most perfect plan and will for our life. It reads like this. Nehemiah was likely devastated to see the level of deviation in the people. The years of work to rebuild Jerusalem and reestablish the devotional faithfulness were all compromised. The people had let up. They allowed self-gain and promotion to corrupt their hearts. If we're going to avoid deviation in our relationship with God, we will need first off to have good leadership. Everybody say good leadership. I know this is important because in verse 6 of the 13th chapter of Nehemiah, we read this. But while all this was going on, this is Nehemiah speaking, while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of the king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked permission to come back to Jerusalem. So all of this deviation is happening while Nehemiah has found himself back in Babylon. Nehemiah put the work in, the walls built, the celebration happens, and he says it's probably time for me to return to my duties as governor there with Babylon. And so we know that while this deviation is happening, their leadership was out of place. This is why it's important that we as churches in America prioritize integrity of your leadership. Leadership has got to submit to God and to people they serve and they've got to have integrity and they've got to be on task. They've got to be where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there. You can look at my life with a scope if you want to. Because I think you should. I think you should look at every person that identifies them as a leader and a pastor in the church. And they should be under a scope. Integrity is a must. When good leadership departs, the people begin to deviate. Are y'all feeling me this morning? Does this make sense? It's vital that leadership has integrity. And that leadership is doing what has been set upon them to do. Nehemiah was absent when this disruption of deviation began to happen. And so first thing we identify is if we're going to be kingdom builders and we're going to avoid deviation, then what we cultivate in leadership matters. The expectation we have in leadership matters in the church. 
That's why we believe that we are servant leaders at the Vineyard Church. We bring ourselves low. We don't demand things for, for placed upon us. We don't lord over. We, we, we think it's important to be servant leaders and to have integrity and to live transparent, open lives. And that's not always easy to do, let me tell you. But I believe it is, it is vital to the success of any congregation and group of people building God's kingdom and avoiding deviation. In the absence of good leaders, things in our life can begin to drift. They can drift. We can deviate. I'm going to tell you something. You have to work at keeping good leaders in your life. Here's why. Leadership requires honor. We need to have honor towards our leaders. Leaders, good leaders, will let you close. They'll live a transparent, open life. They'll have integrity. And, and, and just because you have that scope doesn't mean we don't place honor. Because the Bible tells, tells us to honor all people, also to honor our leaders. And so honor is important. And what honor looks like is honor looks like respect. Honor looks like gratitude. And honor looks like accountability. And so you've got to place honor on somebody for them to be a leader in your life. They're not over you. They're not better than you. They're not any. Everybody needs a leader. I have to have a leader. Every person needs a leader in their life, needs someone in, in there helping them be accountable, helping them, you know, stay in posture of respect and honor. And, and so it, it keeps us in alignment with God. When we lose honor, we fall out of alignment with God. Here's the thing. If you can't honor a leader who you do see, how can you honor your true ultimate leader, God, who you don't see? <laughs> Leadership is not in place for the person to be proud and arrogant or think that they have something over somebody leadership is in place to point us all to the true leader jesus and keep us living in a place of honor when you fall out of honor you fall out of alignment with god we've, we've got to we've got to have things and people in our life that that hold us in tension to 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 you know tailor our lives under the instruction of god and so good leadership is vital. You guys with me this morning? Yes. Secondly, if you follow along with me, if we are going to avoid deviation in our relationship with God, we will secondly need to watch our patterns. Watch our patterns. You will develop things in your life like patterns, thought patterns, action patterns, work patterns, family patterns. Uh, you, you're going to develop patterns in your life and you've got to learn to know those patterns and you've got to pay attention to them. I know patterns are important because in Nehemiah, the 13th chapter in verse 18, Nehemiah said this to the people in their season of deviation. He said, didn't your ancestors do the same things? Didn't they do the exact same thing? Weren't they in the same pattern so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city and now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. You're, 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 you're lacking honor for the instruction of God. And, and our, our instruction might look a little different than Old Testament instruction, but it will not be void of devotion. It will not be void of a full heart serving God. It will not be void of pursuing his kingdom with everything that you have. And here, Nehemiah is saying there's patterns that happen. And you've got to watch those patterns. You've got to pay close attention to the patterns in your life. And so Nehemiah is giving us some, some real good instruction on how we avoid deviation. You got to know your patterns. You got to know the patterns of other people. It's really, let me give you some really, really good advice this morning. Watch what other people do 
that's stupid and don't do it. Did that come out right? When you see people live in stupid, ignorant patterns and fall on their face, like avoid doing that. It's really important, like we can learn from other people's mistakes and if we have the wisdom of God nurtured in our life, we're going to look at the patterns in people's lives and we're going to say, you know what, that doesn't end well. I've seen that before. I, I've seen that very thing play out many, many, many times and it doesn't end well. And so I don't want to associate myself with dysfunctional patterns, whether they be my own or whether they be the ones that I'm seeing other people do, I make a decision to be careful about my patterns. God and Satan and his rulers in spiritual dark forces both work in patterns. God has schematics and patterns of success, and the enemy has patterns and schematics and devices of evil entrapments to entangle you and keep you from building God's kingdom. The enemy tries to mirror God, even though last week Pastor Validia informed us that he's no comparison. He's no equal or counterpart to God. God is God alone, and there's none like him, there's none before him, there's none after him, he's everything. But there is this little enemy of our souls that tries to entrap us, and so we have to pay attention to patterns. Everybody say patterns. You know, I, I was growing up, and I was in a, uh, I did pretty good in my life in school and, and, and things like that, but early on, I went through a lot of hardship and pain, and so I developed a pattern of running. Like, if things didn't go how I wanted them to go, and the time period that I determined they should happen and go, then I would start quickly looking for another place in geography to make that happen. Well, this didn't happen on my time the way I wanted it to happen, so let me go over here and start over. And so I got in this pattern of just starting over and starting over and starting over. And, and I grew up with a father who, who suffered from, from addiction. And, and so there was patterns, generational patterns that I saw, you know, uh, siblings and, and, and cousins and uncles and family members going through these patterns. And, and I remember, you know, at one point in my life, my my mom, she, she said, you know what, Dakota, I'm a little concerned about you. She saw a person I was hanging out with, and she said, man, that, that's a little bit dangerous. And then there was a time I was in high school, and I drank, and I remember my mom came down on me so hard. She was like, she wasn't having it. She, she knew the pattern that was getting ready to open up over my life. And so she was doing everything she could in desperation to help me see that pattern that played out in my father's life and my grandfather's life. And, and she saw the generational pattern happening. And so she was like, oh, no, no, no. Give me them keys. Uh, give me everything. You ain't going nowhere. You're going to school and home. And I'm like, what? You know, it, it, I didn't see the pattern, but she saw the pattern. And so then I, I tried to run and do things. And can I tell you this morning, like, it's easy to get caught in thinking that gr the grass is, like, greener on the other side. And sometimes it is. But can I tell you most consistently that the grass is greener where we water it? And, and we've got to endure. We've got to work through seasons of our life. And I'm not saying that... You know, grass is definitely greener in Missouri. It's just, it rains a lot there. But what I'm saying is, spiritually speaking, like we've got to be a people of endurance who understand that patterns happen and we have got to stay plugged in. Or stay plugged in. You ever seen people who maybe get in a pattern of, uh, of like they're real consistent in church and they're real active in church and then one thing happens and you, 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 you know, re reveal your humanity in some sense and all of a sudden they're gone. Like, like you have, like, I have humanity. 
I've got to condition too. I'm just saying, like, um, it, you know, it, it, and like they're they're plugged in, and then something happens, and this pattern takes place, and and they're gone. And we, for years, have labeled that as, oh, they have church hurt. Oh, oh, they, they, they've got church hurt. Uh, they don't go anymore because they got church hurt. And, and, I, and, I, and I recognize there's probably some place for that. And, uh, but, but have you ever thought about the people who, who hurt the church? Oh, we don't want to hear it this morning. Okay. You, you know, you, you, you make commitment and you build relationship and you build trust and you get opportunity and you're there one day and then the next day you're, you're gone. Be, because one thing, you know, went out of place and there's a pattern that people go through. And, and, and we've got to be, you know, understand that, that people depend on us in the church. We work together as a family. And when someone in the family is kind of offbeat and following some other pattern, like that's, that's a, that tends to lead us in deviation from God. And so patterns are important. You guys with me this morning? Thirdly, in your notes... If we're going to avoid deviation in our relationship with God, we will need to course correct. Course correct. You ever been driving down the road and maybe you have the navigation and you missed a turn and then immediately the navigation starts trying to reroute you? Let me reroute you back on track. And what happens in, 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 in times of deviation is we make one wrong turn and Rather than immediately course correcting, the enemy exploits that and, and our flesh kind of like gets wrapped up in that. And then we can keep drifting and keep drifting and keep drifting. But Nehemiah, you know, he demonstrates for us somebody who, who you know, says, you know what? I see things are falling apart and I'm going to get back to Jerusalem. I'm going to ask the king again and I'm going to get back over there and we're going to line some things up in verse 19 he said this when evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath he recognized that there was a gaping hole in the construct and the order for the city and the people of God that God said, you don't do these things on Sabbath day, and they were doing it. And Nehemiah said, I'm going to stand back up. I'm going to course correct. I'm going to show up, and I'm going to make sure that these things don't happen. And so we've got to be people, Nehemiah's in our family and in our homes, that say we're going to course correct. Things might have been deviating, and we might have got off track, and we might have lost sight of what we're supposed to be doing. But we're going to stand up as Nehemiah's, and we're going to recognize the things in our lives that have gotten off track. And we're going to get right back to where we need to be. And that might be a little tough, and that might be a little hard, and it might be uncomfortable, conversations that we have to have but it will get us back where we need to be with God so we can advance the kingdom the way that we're called to course correct don't wait don't stay off track don't continue and just just allow ourselves to just be pulled around by these circumstances and things that are happening that's what they want to do these circumstances that, that may be happening for us as a church or, you know, in your own uh, context of your own life. And, and they just want to pull you and they want to control your emotions and want to control your attitude, want to control, you know, your finances, want to control your time and just wants to pull you away in deviation and just have you just captive. But we've got to make a stand in our life and we've got to make a decision. I've been called to be a Nehemiah. And I've been called when I see things are off track to put in the work and to show up and do what I'm called to do. I'm going to be there. I'm going to show up. I'm going to work through the hard seasons. You know, this is one of the most challenging times for me that I've ever been in, in, in ministry and in my adult life. Right here, right now. We're in it. And there were moments that I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to crawl in a corner and just lay in the bed and cry and, you know, and just be like, oh, woe is me. And, 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 and something, you know, shook inside of me and said, no, no, we're not going to do that. 
I'm not going to get pulled and deviate. I'm going to worship my God the best that I possibly can. And I'm going to put my best foot forward no matter the circumstances. And I don't want this thing right here changing towards God or towards the people I love. And so we've got to course correct. When we, when we, you know, we're hit with, hey, we're going to shut you out. All right, we'll go outside. Okay, we're watching the weather. Nice weather. We'll keep going. Okay, it's going to get really cold. We need a building. Let's just stay on track with what God is saying and not allow ourselves to deviate from the plan of God for our life. In order to course correct we'll have to move past an obstacle. That obstacle is the obstacle of our pride. None of us want to realize or face the fact that maybe, you know, we have to accept to, to, that things aren't going to go our way. That maybe we have to accept certain circumstances and that we have to move past that and we've got to get past our pride in that and we've got to say well that's I you know for me I'm, I'm trying to be real and just make this make sense like for for longest time when they kicked us out of the, out of our building and did this stuff I'm like no no you know I was just no I'm not leaving like I'm staying right here I don't want to move and, and, and then somewhere inside of me like I had to course correct and say I that's not, that's not working, and I, and I can't keep approaching it that way. I've got I've to stay tuned to, to God's voice, and we've just got to move with our best foot forward. We've got to course correct, and so we've got to get past our pride. You know, we've we got to get past it. Sometimes to be in God's best for your life, you've got to reconcile that maybe some decisions we made or maybe some things we said or did weren't necessarily the right ones, but praise God that his mercy endures forever and that his grace gives to us a better way. His blood speaks a better word for us and leads us down where we need to be. But if I'm going to do that, I've got to get rid of my pride. I just do. I just have to get rid of my pride. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. The last sort of pillar of thought that Nehemiah gives to us in chapter 13 is this. If we're going to avoid deviation in our relationship with God, we will need to value the right relationships. I think this is a really important one. We need to value the right relationships. We know this is important. Who who we spend time with and who we value, what relationships we prioritize and value. Because in verse 4 of Nehemiah 13, we hear this. Before this, Elishib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. If we rewind... Back to chapter 1 uh, of Nehemiah, we know that Tobiah was an opposer of the kingdom building. Tobiah was on the other side. He was with the naysayers and all those people trying to stop the rebuilding of the wall. And so here we have an inside person flirting with the enemy. He's got a relationship and a tie to somebody who's against God's house. They're, they're actually like in posture against the move of God. And this person's been put in leadership and they've exposed God's house. They, they've been in control of an area of the temple in which all of the things for, for, for worship and for proper sacrifice to God are stored. And so they're kind of like taking up space and giving room in God's house for, for, for other purposes. And he's, he's just closely associated with somebody who's opposing God's house. 
I think it's really important. I'm not saying don't have friends with, with people that aren't Christians. I'm not saying don't, don't you know, don't, don't associate with anybody who's not a Christian. Please hear me. I got all kinds of unsaved friends. What I'm saying is we got to prioritize and we got to value our relationships in a healthy way. And you got to know who's for God and who's against God. You got to understand how close you're letting people into your life that oppose the plan of God. This is really important. This is really, really important. Because if you're letting people in your home, and you're letting people in your family, and you're letting people hang out with your kids that don't know God's plan for their life, you, you got to know that. That means something because people can slither themselves right in there and try to bring destruction to the house of God. And we got to be like Nehemiah's, and we got to know the difference. You got to know who's there to serve God and who's not. I'm sorry. I love people. I love everybody, but when they start bringing destruction to the plan of God for my life, I got a problem with that. You start disturbing my peace, and you start trying to take me off track, I got to draw a line in the sand. I got to place a boundary there. Because I'm not about to let somebody come bring havoc in my home and disrupt God's house and the move of God. It means something what we're doing. We're kingdom builders and we got to know what relationships we are placing value on. My mama told me one time, son, you tell me who you're hanging out with and I'll tell you who you are. Well, 1 Corinthians tells me bad company corrupts good character. I said bad company corrupts good character. My Bible is still true. Bad company, it corrupts your character. And we got to know what relationships we are valuing. I used to think, well, just let anybody in close to you. Come on, it'd be all right. We'll take them and lead them to Jesus. Yeah, just lead them to Jesus, uh-huh, yeah. And meanwhile, they're going to lead you into deviation from the plan of God for your life because it matters who you spend your time with. I'm sorry, I still believe the Bible. Y'all with me this morning? Okay. Who you're in relationship not only determines who you spend your time with, but it eliminates and and makes clear for you who you can't spend time with. And so if all my time is invested over here and I'm spending time with all the wrong people, then I got nothing left to spend it in the places that I'm supposed to be. Oh, come on. I feel like there's a filter for relationships this morning. There's a sifting. There's a sifting for relationships. Can I tell you that we just might be at one of the greatest hours that, that the city of Ridgecrest has ever seen in the kingdom of God advancing like never before. And every, I want to make sure that I'm a part of every single aspect of it. I don't want to miss nothing that God's doing. If he's there, that's where I want to be. I don't want to miss anything that God's doing. And so we got to take and we got to be real concerned about the people we spend our time with. If we're not careful will have a tendency to draw to people that meet us in our comfort zone. Oh, I'll just go with this person because they'll let me rant. And they'll let me say all kinds of nonsense. And, and I'm just venting. I got to get it out. You know, I just got to. No, 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 no. No. No, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. And every word that comes from my mouth matters. And there's moments that I got to pull myself back. And I got to think, oh my God, what did I just say? What am I saying? What am I doing? What am I giving life to? And what am I speaking death over? And certain people, they'll be like in a nice pretty little box for you to come over here and cry and whine and vent and talk about how bad it is. And you ain't got time for that. You don't have time to be over here. You got to be over here in God's purpose for you. Dead sinner, building the kingdom. And yeah, you know, we get caught in that. But you don't have any more time for it. 
you you got to be on purpose, living your destiny, doing what God's called you to do, and you got to let go of the past, and you got to let go of the hurt, and you got to let go of the disappointment, and you got to say, I'm going to get dead center on what God has for me, and I don't want to be any other place he's not at, Bob. I got boundaries. Look at your neighbor and say, get boundaries. There's a tendency to hang with those people that'll let you stay relaxed in your comfort zone. You need to be around people that stimulate you for the greatest possibility of your life. You need to be around people that stimulate you and inspire you to live in the greatest victories that God has. you got to be around people that when you start talking and you're in discouragement, they say, no, 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 no. We're not about to stay in discouragement. We're going to come and we're going to make a decision that we're going to seek God in this matter. And that's the end of it. I'm going to get God's best for my life. End of the story. If I messed up and I had a misstep, I'm a course correct. If I got sidetracked, I'm going to course correct. I'm going to get the best of what God has for me in church this morning. I'm here to tell you, you're going to get the best of what God has for you. In those days of deviation, they're behind us. Come on, let's stand and worship. Father, we bless you, and I pray that you would release right now wisdom from heaven. That you would pour out upon us wisdom, insight, direction, and that you would pave away for us. You would split the Red Sea in front of our enemies, and that you would make a path where there seems to be no path. You would make a way where there seems to be no way. And we commit in our hearts this morning, we can't be in control of the circumstances, but we can be in control of how we submit to you and how we respond to them, God. We're not in control of every decision that every person makes. We can't control that. We can control how we worship. We can control how we stay committed. And we can control how we stay rooted and planted in you, regardless of the season. Let's worship together for a few moments. And the world was born Life begins and ends in the dust you pour Faith commanded And the mountains move Fear is losing ground to our hope in you Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on Impossible things in your name they shall be done Freedom conquered All our chains undone Sin defeated Jesus is overcome Triumph when the third day dawn Darkness was denied when the stone was gone Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on Impossible things in your name, they shall be done Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on Impossible thing in your name they shall be done Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus 
is our God unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God unstoppable. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Father, we bless you. We pray that every person would leave with strength. They would leave with full hearts, encouraged, admonished. Yes, Lord. Fill us up. As we go out, fill us up. Just fill us up, God. Just sit here for just a quick moment as we leave. Renew us, God. Refine us. Refresh us. Have your way in us, God. Have your way in us. Come on, that's a prayer this morning. Have your way in me, God. Let's pray that prayer. Have your way in me, God. Have your way in me. I see layers and layers of confusion and weight and pain and regret coming off right now. It's a sense of regret, guilt, shame, hurt, pain. Just coming off layers coming off right now in Jesus name there's a freedom bring a fresh renewed freedom upon us Lord to be in the most greatest sense of celebration of who you are (laughs) we're on the winning side we are fully intent on finding our victory in you We bless you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. Hope that you have a beautiful Christmas. It's such a good time to be together. 